It's an honor to be here uh, in Pasadena tonight, here in a beautiful and distinguished library uh, with librarians, I believe, surrounding us uh, and supporting us. As you may have read, the people of the book is dedicated to the librarians. Mm -hmm. So it's fitting to be here. When Rosemary called uh, in January to invite me to join you for this evening, I was both honored and also terrified, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I was not sure that I was the person to speak on this book this night, and I did my best to suggest other people with great academic credentials, um, with experience in Muslim and Jewish uh, theology and history, and I'm here, and that's a testimony to Rosemary's perseverance. No one can say no to her. So watch out if she is uh, at your door, which she has been at mine, or, uh, or on the phone. But I am grateful to be here. I noticed this, uh, this book, People of the Book, a couple of years ago when I was uh, perusing the shelves at Vroman's. I make pilgrimages to Pasadena quite regularly and Vroman's is often a destination. And what caught my eye actually was the cover of the book. It's beautiful and all of the publicity that I have seen that you have so carefully created has the same appeal. It is just something special, kind of awe-inspiring. The colors, the blue, the gold, the, the lines, it invites one in. And so I was drawn to the book. The title intrigued me, People of the Book. I'm a minister. The biblical tradition is part of what I live and work with. Um, and so I picked it up and read the tag that was a recommendation from a Roman staff member, which assured me it was a good and wonderf wonderful read. And I took the book home and put it in my bag of books to read when I travel because it was lightweight and ready to go. When Rosemary called, I knew it was in the bag. <laughs> I dug out the book. And I had this incredible, uh, wonderful surprise. I devoured the story. And as I considered what I might be able to bring you tonight, I realized that the story contained in people of the book is a story that in many ways resonates with the ministry I was privileged to have for several decades. So I'm here tonight in gratitude for the people with whom I was able to work over all the years at the Claremont Colleges. Uh, rabbis, ministers, Roman Catholic priests, Orthodox priests, Buddhists, Muslim students, Hindus, faculty, staff, a collection of individuals who through their faithful observance of their traditions taught me more about mine than I ever imagined I could know. They taught me what it meant to be a person committed to a historical tradition helped me understand who I was in relation to their deep and profound uh, observance of, of, of their traditions that, about which I really had to learn. I started my work at the Claremont Colleges when I was uh, almost just out of graduate school, out of seminary. I had served a church for several years on the East Coast. I was coming home to California. And I was... Uh, uh, an eager, uh, hopefully thoughtful, but ready to serve Protestant Christian minister. And I walked into a setting as Rosemary has described, which was an interfaith setting. My colleagues were distinguished and much, much older rabbi and Catholic priest. They had no idea what to do with a young woman who was coming to serve alongside them. And I was pregnant besides. <laughs> that confounded them terribly. <clears throat> but we learned to work with each other, to 
to grow with each other, we, I think, rub the rough edges off of each other and were able to minister in that first wave of service uh, in a profound way to the college community. So here I am tonight, grateful for all of those men and women who have helped me grow. And I invoke some of their names as we begin so that you can get a sense of the cloud of witnesses that is here with us, men and women of faith and some of no faith but who are deeply committed to mending and tending our world. Heim Dove and Leslie, Devorah and Fatma, Shayla and Tahir, Kartik, Nita, Steve, Judy, Dror, Bob. These names represent the cloud of witnesses that has shaped my learning and my work. So when I read people of the book, <clears throat> I had these experiences in my, in my history. And when I read the historical traditions that were representative in the people of the book, when I thought about the, um, the points that Geraldine Brooks was making, uh, sometimes not so subtly, and we can talk about that a little bit later, uh, I realized that People of the Book was an important work for an enterprise like One City, One Book, because it makes us all think about who we are, where we come from, what the other person is, what, they, what their history contains. And I think as we consider the People of the Book this evening, we, we can come away with uh, some uh, marching orders, if you will, some new ways of being in our community with people we both know and with people that we may want to come to know as time goes on. One thing uh, was when I was working with students that I always did was to tell them that anyone religious who was coming to talk to them about any subject ought to be able to locate uh, where, where that person has come from. There is no one person who can give a singular view of a Christian view of anything. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Orthodox Christianity are all nuanced traditions. And I want you all to understand that. That's critically important as we think about the themes that are going to come out of people of the book. When, when we ever think of a religion, of a religious tradition as monolithic, we make a mistake at the get-go. We make a mistake because we forget to look at the historical situation from which a person speaks, or the historical situation from which a particular doctrine or idea arises. So just always remember, and this is, these are the words I would use again with my students, always find out the perspective of the person who is speaking to you. So, as Rosemary said, I am a Presbyterian minister ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA more than 30 years ago. I grew up in Southern California, so the lens through which I see the world is Southern California, uh, which is particular, it's unique. I worked as a minister for a while in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, just at the time when the steel industry collapsed. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my California worldview was limited. It did not prepare me at that moment to deal with the complexity and the disjunction and the sorrow that people of uh, Eastern and Western Pennsylvania uh, experienced as the industry that had sustained them forever and ever, it seemed to them, collapsed. I had to learn a different perspective that enriched my experience and my life. But that's an example of how every single one of us comes with a certain lens, a certain perspective, to any issues that really, really matter. So with this kind of general frame of reference, I came to the story of people of the book. 
And in it I discovered a tale that melded history, religious community, human creativity expressing itself in art, the complexity of human relationships, and both the nobility and the evil that lies within the human spirit and can be expressed in human action. We could focus on any of those themes. We could spend night after night gathering to talk about any one of them. But what I wanted to do tonight was to look at one of the main themes that arises in Geraldine Brooks' treatment of the Haggadah of Sarajevo. And that is uh, the term and the historical period of convivencia. I promise you that Rosemary and I did not conspire. She used that term uh, to describe my experience in the introduction and I smiled to myself because that's exactly what drew me to the term, my experience. And so we're going to think about convivencia as an historical experience in uh, medieval Spain and we're also going to use uh, Brooke's own words to think about what convivencia might lead us to if we think about claiming that term in Pasadena, the Pasadena of today. But before we begin with uh, words, I wanted to show you just a few pictures. So we're talking about a Haggadah, the Passover, um, the 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 book, the, the manuscript that guides Jewish people around the world at the Seder meals. And let's see, let's now, you're going to see the limits of my uh, technical ability here. At Yale University, there is an exhibit, and it's online, bless, bless Yale, uh, of Haggadahs that are just beautiful. This is the Sarajevo one that, that the book refers to. And you can see just the power, the color, the beauty, the intricacy of the illumination. Here's another picture from, from it. Just soak that in for a minute. It's a beauty, it creates awe, and in, in the novel, uh, the protagonist, Hannah, is said to, when, when it is, the book is brought to her for the first time in the museum under the great uh, security that was surrounding her. She said she was awed by the beauty, the malachite, the lapis lazuli, the vermilion, the red, um, and you can see why that would be. It is a beautiful, stirring work. But you should also know that there are other manuscripts. Uh, this is called The Bird's Head. Haggadah. It's from the 13th century and it's the oldest surviving uh, German illuminated manuscript. You can see it's slightly different. We have the Darmstadt Haggadah from Leipzig in the 1430, it's dated 1430, similar time. Again, intricate and beautiful illumination. The Rylands manuscript from the 14th century in Catalonia. Just take in the various uh, colors and pictures. Again, this is telling the story of the Exodus and it would been, have been used by Jewish families or a Jewish community at the Seder table. There would be eating, there would be drinking, there would be hospitality, conviviality, if you will. There would be uh, the life of a community being expressed around these manuscripts. The Mites Haggadah. This is the Prague Haggadah from 1526. This is the Moss Haggadah from, uh, uh, it's a contemporary work. These manuscripts, this, these texts continue to be created. And this one was commissioned by uh, Richard Levy and his wife, 
They are Jewish leaders in LA. Richard is an expert in Jewish liturgy and he commissioned this work um, This is, again, a, the Prague. It's a wood, wood cut. This is the Jerusalem Haggadah from uh, uh, 1968. It is uh, reflecting the euphoria that gripped Israel following the victory in the Six-Day War in June 1967. You can see it's a slightly more modern view. From the same work. This is the Agam Agam Passover Haggadah. It's a modern Israeli artist uh, who created illustrations which are highly modernistic. He used vibrant colors, stick letters, and geometric geometric shapes. All of it, all of this uh, illustration, whether it's ancient or contemporary, is meant to evoke for the people the life-giving nature of the Seder meal. This is the New, U New Union Haggadah. It uh, was uh, printed in 1982, uh, reflecting its era it's talking about the women of the biblical text. And so in this uh, particular version, when there is the question that comes in the Seder uh, meal, why is this night different from all other nights? Uh, the answer to the question is uh, about the four matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And then a final one that shows a contemporary or uh, the way modern issues uh, come into the Haggadah stories. This is a Holocaust uh, version that, that seeks to remember those who are observing Passover of the trials and tribulations and the warning that the Holocaust would bring uh, to the world. And now we're back to the Sarajevo manuscript. I'm going to leave that up for a while because I want you just to um, be able to look at it and have it be the backdrop of uh, our consideration this evening. All right. So I told you that we would spend some time thinking about the term that appears in many different places in People of the Book. Uh, Brooks notes convivencia uh, over and over when she brings to conclusion some of her themes. And again, I, I noted that uh, I, when I was reading the book, actually I was a little bit annoyed at times, and some of you may have felt that way. You would be going along, humming along just fine, and all of a sudden there would be this summary paragraph, kind of stiltedly put in there. The characters would say, and so, and you just know that she wanted to make that point. Finally, I got used to that uh, literary technique, if you want to call, call it that. Um, and I realized she's a journalist. And she is used to summation, to getting to the point. So she wanted to make sure, I think, that we readers didn't miss the underlying message of what this story was uh, trying to accomplish. A great story. Uh, some good drama. I loved the uh, uh, the pieces about trying to the mysteries about trying to find out what the various uh, uh, parts of the manuscript that weren't evident uh, what what they meant uh, the rock salt and the the hair and the the insect wing all of the I thought that was fascinating about how a, a conservator might go about uh, finding the meaning of those uh, those things in an ancient manuscript um, but really her point in, in this novel I think is to get us to think about convivencia what does it mean for people of different faiths to live together side by side what does it mean people of different nationalities, of different socioeconomic groups, of diff people who are different from each other. How do we 
so to speak, get along. She's asking that in the particular framework of Muslim Jewish Christian around the Sarajevo Haggadah, but she really is making a bigger point, I think. What does convivencia mean in today's world? In historical terms, convivencia is actually a complicated idea. It's not straightforward. Um, historically, there's lots of questions about the time in med medieval Spain when Muslims, Jews, and Christians did inhabit the same geographic place, which is now Spain. It, uh, Spain. It was a term coined by a Spanish historian, Americo Castro, and he um, coined the term as he was trying to write in the mid-1900s a history of, of kind of the Spanish nation. Spain had a little bit of a problem after Franco. There had to be some understanding of how things could have gone the way they did. There were questions about why Spain was lagging behind other countries in Europe in a variety of ways. And Americo Castro, Spanish historian, uh, was very interested in the medieval period as a place where he could go to draw positive and potent uh, cultural resources uh, to to provide a history, an underpinning of history for the uh, emerging Spanish uh, national movement. But when you look at the term, so he used it, and then other people picked it up. It's been used um, both in positive and in, in some ways negative ways. Some groups have used the term to uh, claim slightly more benefic beneficence over the other groups. Sometimes they have you various historians have used the term to claim that there was more uh, cooperation than perhaps the historical record as we continue to dig into that record actually shows. Um, it, sometimes historians are touting uh, tolerance um, and uh, um, an era that was just so beautiful that uh, we can overlook some of the more difficult issues that were were at work in, medi in the medieval time and in medieval the area of uh, of the cultural uh, collaboration. In the reader's guide, at the end of uh, People of the Book, Brooks is asked, "What do you think is the?" It, what, it, what do you think it is about the real Sarajevo Haggadah that has allowed it to survive through the centuries? She answers, it is a fascinating question. Why did this little book always find its protectors when so many others did not? It is interesting to me that the book was created in a period, Convivencia, Spain, when diversity was tolerated, even somewhat celebrated, and that it found its way centuries later to a similar place, Sarajevo, which some, has been known as the uh, European Jerusalem, a place where the faiths came together and lived uh, with great intermingling. So even when hateful forces arose in those societies, Brooks goes on, and crushed the spirit of the multi-ethnic interfaith acceptance. There were those individuals who saw what was happening and acted to stop it in any way they could. One of my colleagues and friends, Ken Wolf at Pomona College, is actually an expert in this period of uh, medieval uh, Spanish history. And his work looks at the inter intersection and interactions between uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews uh, in, in the Spanish uh, area. He's written a great paper, you can go online and read it in its entirety, that talks about the various interpretations of convivencia, both the positive ones and the more troubling ones. But he points to two historians who he thinks that in the last decade have a uh, I have located meaning about con convivencia that, that are important for us to understand. He, he uh, talks about Maria Rose Menocal's The Ornament of the World, how Muslims, Jews, and Christians created a culture of tolerance in medieval Spain. 
and what he tells us about her work, and she wrote her, uh, that book in 2002, she believed that Islam, the, Muslim, the Muslims who moved to Spain in the 700s, 600s, 700s of the Common Era, brought with them a notion of, uh, uh, they were speaking Arabic, and the Arabic that, that infused their culture, the Arabic that they used, was profoundly open in its, uh, its ability to handle complexity and, and uh, uh, collaboration. Arabic had been the language of these people for centuries, and with the coming of Islam, Arabic took on the religious portions of Islam, but also retained its broad sweep of the historical understanding. And it was that culture that came into the Spanish territories, the territory that is now Spain. And so she thinks that that part of uh, the Muslim uh, uh, approach in Spain helped the collaborative uh, the, the collaboration developed between the Jewish tradition, the Jewish literary tradition, and even the Christian literary tradition. And so Arabic was the glue, and it provided a philosophical framework that was open and more elastic, and it provided um, an understanding that there were different philosophic uh, philosophies in the world that could be embraced, and that, that uh, they did not have to be uh, excluded. So Menachal's thesis um, seems to have grown out of the simple observation that Arabic, long before becoming the holy language of the Quran, had served as the vehicle for a sophisticated secular poetic tradition, writes Ken Wolf. As Islam spread, so did Arabic, bringing with it a highly developed Arabic literary culture that could and did appeal to Muslims and non-Muslims. She uh, examines um, a number of historical experiences at the time. And uh, in these vignettes, she traces and illustrates the proliferation of this cultural open-mindedness. And most of the chapters in her book, Ken describes, um, consider the careers of key individuals. And I'm going to name them off for you so you get a, a sense of the sweep. <clears throat> like one is Salmon Ibn Nagrilla, the great Jewish poet and vizier of the Kingdom of Granada. Petrus Alfonsi, the converted Jew who introduced the English court of Henry I to the wonders of Arab sciences. Peter the Venerable, the abbot of Cluny, who was responsible for overseeing the first Latin translation of the Quran and Thomas Aquinas, whose controversial synthesis of Christian theology and Aristotelian philosophy was built on the foundations laid uh, by Averroes and Maimonides. Sorry. It was the Arabic tradition of secular poetry that triggered the golden age of Hebrew poets in El Andalus and in a vernacular form infiltrated uh, southern France helping to shape the troubadour tradition. These are quite sweeping uh, statements, but looking at the historical record, Menachal sees that this was the impact of this, this uh, Arabic, this, this trust in Arabic, if you will, to bring together and to infiltrate and to collaborate with the Jewish and Christian uh, communities in the regions of Spain. The other historian that Wolf points to comes at co Convivencia in a slightly different way. He looks at the historical record, his name is Chris Loney, and comes up with a little bit more sober, maybe a little bit more realistic assessment of the culture of tolerance uh, in that medieval period. He writes, Despite the fact that medieval Spaniards were tossed by the Muslim conquest into an ocean 
of clashing religious cultures and were utterly ill-equipped by modern standards to navigate such uncharted waters. They somehow accommodated each other's beliefs and lifestyles in ways that humanity's later generations have often been hard-pressed to match. Ken Wolf says that Loney believes that it was simple practicality. They were living side by side, these peoples. They had to survive. And so if they were in a territory and they had to get food, they would work together to build a common oven or they would tend the land together so that they would have the economic resources to actually live. And if they did well and the economy flourished, even better. Then there was the collaboration of ideas and a little more gentle life that might have emerged. But in fact, it was simple practicality that was the key to their getting along. I think that's an interesting thing to consider. I think both are. Kind of an overarching uh, philosophical, cultural press that Menachal has, thinking about Arabic. And then the practical realities of life. You're living next to somebody Maybe a, a community that you don't know and maybe you don't like very much, but in fact you're going to work with them because you want to live. So these two historians, Ken Wolf says, give clues to what this convivencia perhaps was more realistically uh, like and gives us some tools perhaps to think about the implications of people of the book. Back to Brooks. The protagonist, Hannah, says, as she is describing the article she is trying to put together about this mysterious manuscript she has been entrusted uh, to conserve, she writes, I wanted to give a sense of the people of the book. The different hands that had made it, used it, protected it. I wanted it to be a gripping narrative, even suspenseful. So I wrote and rewrote certain sections of historical background to use as a seasoning between the discussion of technical issues. I tried to give a sense of the convivencia, of poetry parties on summer nights in beautifully formal gardens, of Arabic-speaking Jews mixing freely with Muslim and Christian neighbors. I would tend to say that that statement is on the romantic side, a little farther out than Menachal. Okay, notice that. That's one of the, we've got to be careful with this convivencia, but she gets, you know, she gets us thinking. People mixing it up, being together. <clears throat> Although I couldn't know the story of the scribe or the illuminator, I tried to give a sense of each of them by explaining the details of their craft and what medieval pavili pavilions of the book were like and where each such artisans fit fitted into the social milieu. Then I wanted to build up a certain tension around the dramatic, terrible reversal of the Inquisition and the expulsion. And I wanted to convey fire and shipwreck and fear. We have to remember that the era of the convivencia ended in Spain with um, really tragedy. Uh, the monarchy, the Spanish monarchy ascended uh, and was able to defeat the Muslims and expel them from the territories. And then in 1492, it became apparent that the Jews were not going to be welcome under this new monarchy and the, uh, the expulsion occurred uh, and the Jews were, had to flee. And they fled northward, well, north and south, actually. But there was a great migration, and the history of the Haggadah follows some of that migration. The tragedy of the expulsion was followed by the, the terrible cruelty of the Inquisition, the desire to purify the new, uh, the new land that had been created. Um, and it was a time when uh, uh, there was just terrible suffering. Uh, we're able to see in this period that while there are moments when we coexist, when we live next to, when we experience the other, 
then in human history there are these moments of tragedy when that breaks down and breaks apart for reasons that are very difficult to define but it happens and then we live with the aftermath of that of that terrible cruelty Brooks again guides the reader to a critical insight she's in a, she's in she's at Harvard and she's talking with her uh, chemist friend Roz who says it would be something to be back there when the Hag Haggadah was still just some family's book a thing to be used before it became an exhibit locked up in in a vitrine in the museum it's still doing what it Roz says it's still doing what it was meant to do or will be as soon as it goes into the museum it was made to teach he says and it might teach a lot more than the Exodus story what do you mean Hannah asks well from what you've told me the book has survived the same human disaster over and over again think about it you've got a society where people tolerate difference like Spain in the Convi Convivencia and something's humming along creative prosperous then somehow this fear this hate this need to demonize the other it just sort of rears up and smashed the whole society inquisition Nazis extremists Serb nationalists same old same old it seems to me the book at this point bears witness to that so in this manuscript that is housed in Sarajevo Brooks is telling us we have in a way a conscience we have uh, something that is beautiful something that people consider to be invaluable which is calling to the human community to ask those deep and profound questions about how do we live together why do things fall apart how can we learn from those that are different how do we stop the hatred and the anger and the desire to lord it over individuals and communities that wrecks havoc in our world the Haggadah in Sarajevo seems to be the witness to the fact that good people courageous action in some ways prevails but as the story that Brooks tells in all of its ins and outs reveals that it is a story that is is painful not easy requires uh, requires endurance and requires ordinary people good people like everyone in this room to do the right thing at times when they least expect to have the capability to do it so I want to make a few comments about what I think the witness of this Haggadah might be for us and why I think it matters that Pasadena has read it in this season this year I think it tells us that it, in the painful history that evil does exist that we have to be realistic about the fact that there are forces that conspire that want power that want to be in control that think they are so right that they will put down and kill to get their way from the monarchs of Spain to the Nazis in Germany to the nationalists that shelled Sarajevo it's never uh, easy the history it's always complex but we see the evil that these moments in history and that these people create I thought it was very interesting uh, in the book that uh, Osren uh, when he's talking about what happened in Sarajevo uh, exhibited words that were to me quite naive but I think that we would say them I might say them here how could you possibly have an ethnic war here he was uh, thinking out loud to Hannah 
in this city when every second person is the product of a mixed marriage. How to have a religious war in a city where no one ever goes to church. For me, the mosque is like a museum, quaint, a quaint thing to do with the grandparents, picturesque. Once a year, we'd go and see the sicker when the dervishes dance, and it was like a theater. My best friend, Danilo, he's a Jew, and he's not even circumcised. Anyway, our parents were all leftists. They thought such things were primitive. Our leader said that it takes two sides to have a war and we would not fight. You can see this wistful, naive sense that it just couldn't happen to us. And I think this book and the Haggadah asks us to be uh, wise about things, asks us to think, to consider how it could happen, how these things do happen, and that um, it makes us uh, think about being aware, I think. Uh, even in 1940, Lola, uh, there's a comment, again, a summary statement by Brooks. Anti-Semitism never was a part of Sarajevo. Look where the synagogue is between the mosque and the Orthodox Church. There was no sense of danger even when the German Reich annexed Austria right up against the borders. Um, they never thought it could happen to them. So I think this book and that Haggadah in that museum in Sarajevo asks all people, all good people, to think about the conditions that could exist, that could get us into trouble, and asks us to stand up and fight against those impulses. And those impulses are intolerance. Those impulses are not looking carefully at the humanity of your neighbor, even someone you don't understand or you don't know, or whose rituals scare you, or whose food is not appealing to you. Simple things and big things. I think we have to look at the humanity of every person in our community and the humanity in the communities that live among us. So being realistic, I think, is a very, very important thing. I think we also have to conserve. Um, one of the great ideas in the in the book to me was this notion, and Hannah, Hannah gets quite uppity about it early on. I'm not a restorer, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I conserve the manuscript. And I love the distinction, all right? It's not conservatism like protecting yourself so much, but it's conserving, and I'll read you what she says. To restore a book, or what Brooks says actually, to restore a book to the way it was when it was made is to lack respect for its history. So if we just want to make things the way we think they were, it's not showing respect. Brooks goes on, I think you have to accept a book as you receive it from the past, generations, and to a certain extent, damage and wear reflect the history. The way I see it, my job is to make it stable enough to allow safe handling and study, repairing only where absolutely necessary. Now, um, my academic training is in history. I think history is really important, and this quotation comes right to where I think we need to think about history. We need to conserve the stories of our individual lives. We need to not spruce them up to restore them some, to some perfect moment in the past. That goes for communities. That goes for um, civic institutions. We need the fullness of the history. We want to bring the history into the present in its positive and maybe its damaged, crooked, uh, not so perfect sense. Because I think as human beings, if we conserve our past, and bring it into the present, we learn things that help us fight off those forces that I was talking about a minute ago. So I'm going to be here promoting this conservation. 
conservation of our story, conservation of our history, conservation of our communities. And then we need to ask one another to very gently hear that story, to take it in, to listen carefully, so that we can learn from one another uh, the fullness of what the past has been. And finally, going back to Menachal, the notion that Arabic was elastic enough to handle complexity, to deal with communities that were very different, to embrace poetry in a different, uh, not a different tongue, but a different worldview, um, it was elastic, it was open, it was uh, free, if you will. I think our intellectual quest has to have those characteristics as well. We need to use all that's at our disposal to be open, to be thoughtful, to think deeply and widely, and not to be motivated by fear. Fear that if we engage someone else's thinking for a spell, it might corrupt us. Fear that if we get too close to someone else's beliefs, it might make us lose our own. I can testify to you that that is not the case. In fact, getting close to someone else's belief system, getting close to someone else's community of faith, enriches one's own in ways that you cannot uh, imagine. But if fear keeps you from that interaction, keeps you from an elastic and open mind, if fear makes you need to be so sure that the lens you see the world through is the only lens, then we don't have the tools we need for the convivencia that perhaps can break forth in our community here in Pasadena. I think this book asks many, many questions. I think it helps us look most deeply into who we are, what makes us human, what gives our lives meaning. It makes us think about how we look at the other, the human being that is different from us, the community that is not our own, and asks us to embrace those communities so that we can learn and grow and live productively. We can flourish in a new conven convivencia. I'm going to end my remarks here, and uh, we're going to conclude by uh, seeing the Nightline video that was done uh, in the mid-90s. Um, it's been shown once before, and I don't know whether any of you have seen it yet. If you haven't, uh, I think what's so interesting is you're going to get a flavor of the places and the people. And it ends with um, really a call to action, if you will, of how people can live together. I hope that gave you a flavor of the story, uh, bringing some of the novel's uh, words and places to life. And you can see the faces of the people. I think that's the part that uh, at the end moved me when I first saw the the, vi the, uh, the video, uh, we see the faces of the people living, probably today, struggling, hoping, helping, um, and that's the call of, I think, this book uh, to all of us as we, uh, as we go forward. Uh, one of the rabbis in the novel talks about uh, beautiful books support our souls, or strengthen our souls. And so I, my hope is that this story about the Sarajevo Haggadah strengthens our souls and gives us the courage to move forward, hopefully, and gratefully. So thank you very much. Thank you.